Okay, dear friends, this is such a beautiful moment uh, and, and such, a, such a privilege to, to welcome uh, to Aalto University, uh, in my opinion, one of the world's leading scholars uh, in humanities. Uh, it's, it's so great to have you here, Barbara. Barbara Fredrickson. Thank you. You know, uh, Barbara's uh, great-grandfather uh, left to the United States from Finland. So, so uh, <laughs> but it's... <laughs> uh, and, and it's um, Barbara's first visit to Finland, so uh, his family wasn't quite up to the Finnish customs as they nowadays are. So, so let's therefore indicate to, to Barbara what a tender and dynamic <laughs> meeting is. So, so please stand up and, and generate a tender and dynamic meeting to these excellent people around you. You know, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, it's such a great group of people we have here. Uh, Barbara uh, is, is the world's uh, leading authority on the psychology of emotions and, uh, and, a, and a key figure in, uh, in, in positive psychology. Uh, we have time until 4 o'clock. Uh, and the way we'll proceed is that uh, first uh, Barbara will talk for maybe an hour or so, perhaps, uh, and, and then uh, we'll discuss, and, and there's a possibility for, for some uh, questions, and we'll close at 4 o'clock. But for now, the great Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. It has been absolutely fabulous to be here. Um, I have uh, the, never been to Finland before, and yet I feel like my bones recognize this place. Um, and so I'm just having these moments of just resonance. Um, so I really appreciate the warm welcome that Asa and others have, have given me and, and this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, the last... Um, more than a dozen years, almost two decades, on the question of the value of positive emotions. What, what good are positive emotions? Why should we care about whether people are experiencing joy, contentment, gratitude? And I, I want to just um, point out at the start that sometimes this can seem like a very trivial question especially in light of the uh, very devastating and um, difficulty world problems that we're facing. When you're talking to somebody who has recently lost their job uh, from the economic crisis and are still struggling months later to feed their family, um, wondering how they're going to pay the mortgage the next month. Um, in these contexts, positive emotions and understanding what they're good for seem out of place. Or we continue to put our young people into situations like this where they don't know what's coming around the corner. And, um, and more than that, sending them into uh, repeat um, deployment, which is a big concern in the United States because the same soldiers are going back again and again. And it's literally wearing them down. Um, facing the issues of global warming and all the uh, fallout from that. Again, in these situations, understanding positive emotions seems trivial. And in the U.S., we have a, a very wide, what's called the achievement gap between African-American children and Caucasian-American children. And that stems from um, very deep and entrenched 
uh, racial um, uh, inequities, and it continues to replicate those racial inequities. And we uh, s seem to have trying to figure out how to narrow the achievement gap. Uh, and, and also in the U.S., a extraordinary problem is our obesity epidemic. Um, it's the new norm to be overweight or obese in the United States, 66% uh, and in some counties, 85% of people are overweight or obese, which puts an enormous strain on our health care system and, our, and the entire economy. Um, and then we're faced with natural disasters worldwide. How do we um, quickly and efficiently extend aid to uh, people who are suffering um, from the aftermath of earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes and all around the world. How do, we, how do we act in the face of natural disasters like that? And I just want to point out that in, with the backdrop of all the ills of society, uh, moments like this where we might be thinking jump for joy seem trivial. And uh, I just want to recognize that. Um, but I also want to point out that there are many, many flavors of positive emotions. And this prototypical, perhaps American version of jump for joy is only but one of the positive emotions on the broader array of uh, positive emotions that we all are capable of. In addition, I want to draw our attention to gratitude. That, that sort of deep in your bones gratitude, just knowing that some aspect of your surroundings or some aspect of your life is a gift to be cherished. Okay, it's a quieter positive emotion. Another quieter positive emotion is the feeling of serenity, a feeling like your current circumstances are just so right and they call you to um, integrate the, your most recent experiences in, into new views of yourself, new views of the world around you so that you savor and integrate um, in, in moments of, of great serenity. Or moments when you can share a laugh with a friend or a child um, and just uh, enjoy your interconnection with another. Or moments when we're inspired by great leaders that help us see uh, better versions of ourselves in the future. And of course, um, Positive emotional moments include moments of feeling loved and cared for and caring towards other people who are important to us. So there's a wide range of positive emotions. And what I want to point out is that far from being trivial or inconsequential, these subtle positive emotional states may hold uh, really important keys to helping us grow and change for the better and helping us address some of these larger societal problems that we face. And this is because, um, well, what I want to share with you today are two core facts about positive emotions. The first one is that they open us. Positive emotions are subtle states, but they have very reliable effects on our um, awareness. And if you allow me to get poetic for just a moment, imagine that you are this water lily. It's very early in the morning, and um, your petals are drawn up around your face. And if you can see out at all from that vantage point, it's just a small stream of light in front of you. Your, your world is actually quite small. As the sun rises in the sky and things warm up, things begin to change. This, with more sunlight, your petals start to uh, pull back from your face, kind of removing those delicate uh, bl blinders. And your world, your experience of the world, quite literally expands. Okay. Um, we know now that this isn't just poetic language, that this isn't just uh, the, the, an idea that poets think is, is um, 
uh, a good description of what positivity does to us. It has now been scientifically tested, this idea that positive emotions open our awareness and change our perception of the very world that we're in. Um, that's something that's been um, tested experimentally and peer-reviewed and presented in um, specialty journals in psychology and more general jur journals in science and neuroscience. And the way these studies are typically done are um, in a, using an exper a laboratory experimental paradigm where we randomly assign certain people to experience positive emotions, other people are randomly assigned not to experience positive emotions, and then we use very precise measures of the breadth of awareness. Um, I want to give you uh, some examples of these. Oh, but first I want to just mention how it is that we induce positive emotions in a laboratory study, because some, some people are curious about this. Uh, a lot of times we use uh, images of animals, cute cute puppies, funny penguins, serene scenes. These aren't um, uh, whoppingly intense positive emotions. They're mild positive emotions that produce these effects. I want to underscore that. Other studies have used um, a very classic technique of giving, randomly assigning uh, people to receive a small gift, um, often a bag of candy, wrapped up tightly in cellophane so people can see what it is, but they can't open it really easily. And that's important because you want to make sure the effects are not the results of a sugar high, that it's actually the result of the uplift of having received a gift. Okay. So by random assignment, people are either given this gift before they take the measures in the study or after as a parting gift. So everybody gets it, the timing is different. Other studies um, use music to elicit uh, a positive emotional state and more neutral sounds for other emotions or sad music as well, as sometimes as a comparison. And I want to just describe to you one of uh, the early studies that my students and I did to test this idea that positive emotions open up people's awareness. What we did was give people a series of abstract items on a test of global versus local visual processing. And the task works a bit like this. You are shown a target figure and then asked which of these two comparison figures uh, best resembles the target. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, one resembles it in its overall global configuration. The other resembles it in its local detail elements. Okay. But what we learned is that if you induce a positive emotion by random assignment, people are far more likely to say the one that matches on its global configuration is the one that's more similar. Um, being in a, pos a temporary positive emotional state um, makes people see the big picture or connect the dots more than to just look at the small detail elements. So that's one way that we know that positive emotions expand people's awareness and allow them to see uh, the bigger picture. There are other experiments that have used very sophisticated eye tracking technology, which um, uh, a camera is aimed at your iris and tracks any movement of, of your eye um, while you're watching a complex array. And um, these studies have used the bag of candy intervention that you either give the, get the bag of candy before or after, seeing a, an array of photos like this, where um, this is one example. All the, all the stimuli had uh, one photo in the center and two photos on the side. And if you don't receive a bag of candy before you look at this scene, Pretty much 90% of the time, you just look at the baby in the center. If people had the bag of candy, they sp spread their time equally across the three babies. OK, all the babies are cute. <laughs> um, but if people are in a neutral state, they're perceiving as ordinary as they ordinarily would, they, they ignore the babies in the periphery. Okay, A simple bag of candy gets people to, to notice 
a broader array, a, a wider environment. Okay. One of my favorite recent experiments that provides evidence for this broadening effect at very early perceptual levels was a brain imaging study um, run by a, a new collaborator of mine, Adam Anderson, and his students at, at University of Toronto. And what they did was they used music to induce either positive emotions or a neutral state. And then they made use of what's known in brain imaging already is that there are specialized areas in the brain that help us perceive faces. Okay, so there's a, there's a face uh, area in the brain. There are other areas of the brain in different locations that light up and show activity when we view places. So um, it's, it's considered the spatial uh, location area of the brain. And what they did was to look at uh, patterns of activation in the face area and the place area um, while people were doing a task. Their, the participant's task while they were in the scanner was very simple. It was to say whether this face that they saw was male or female. Everybody got it right all the time. Um, that wasn't really what they were looking for, but that was the task they gave. Just look at the face and they were explicitly told, ignore everything else that you see. And what they saw was not a, just a face like this. They saw a face surrounded by a place. Okay. But, but participants were told to ignore those places. And sometimes those places, those houses, changed. And sometimes they stayed the same. And what they, saw, what they learned in this study is that if people were induced to feel sad by listening to sad music, or they were induced to feel rather neutral by just listening to neutral tones, um, people were very good at completely ignoring the place surround. You actually couldn't even see blood flow changes in the place areas of the brain because people had very uh, efficiently tuned out the background information. Whereas when people were induced to feel a positive emotion by listening to positive music, you could see that the brain was taking in information about the, the place surrounding the face. So it's as if in a positive emotional state, people can't help but take in more of the surrounding con contextual information. They can't help it. Even if you ask them not to, their brains still register the surrounding context, whereas in any other s emotional state, people can just tune it out, just laser focus on just the central target, um, and they lose the surrounding context. Okay, um, That's the strongest evidence I know that um, positive emotions are broadening at very early perceptual levels. And why this matters. Um, I want to just point out that um, other researchers have looked at um, the effect of, of emotions on people's autobiographical memories. So when people are recalling aspects of their own lives, when they're recalling memories that elicit positive emotions, they actually have better memory for the surrounding detail information. Um, and knowing what we know about the brain imaging findings, it makes perfect sense that, it, well, you actually couldn't tune out that surrounding uh, contextual information. That allows you to have better memory for it. But when people are recalling neutral events or negative events, they're not very good at um, telling you the peripheral detail information about surrounding that memory. So people have better memory for details under positive emotional states. And, um, this really connects to a, uh, a way that Rumi, writing in the 13th century, described how emotions affect perception. He said, there is a way of breathing that's a shame and a suffocation. And yet there's another way of breathing, of, of expiring, what he called a love breath that lets you open infinitely. Okay, and so, I, so this was written in the 13th century to describe how emotions and breathing patterns might affect our ability to be um, open versus you know, really suffocating ourselves. 
Um, and I just want to underscore that now, this many centuries later, we have scientific evidence that there's a truth to this. Okay, we, we are not yet at the point where we have scientific evidence for the infinitely part. That we don't know yet that we can open infinitely. But um, uh, I think Ace is working on that and we'll have an answer to that one soon. Okay. Uh, I want to just quickly point out some of the consequences, why it matters that positive emotions open us. Why, what, what are some of the downstream effects of positive emotions that spring from the fact that they open our awareness? One is that when we have a wider awareness of the world around us, we can see more possibilities. And this is something my students and I have tested in experiments. We've, we induce positive emotions or not, and we ask people to, given, to think about, given how you're feeling right now, list all the things you'd like to do. List all the things you'd like to do right now. People come up with a longer list of possible actions when they're experiencing a positive emotion compared to when they're experiencing a neutral state. So this, uh, this signpost would maybe have one or two possible actions when people are feeling neutral or negative, and many possible actions when people are feeling positive. There's classic research that many of you probably are aware of that links positive emotions to greater creativity. And there's some other work um, by Adam Anderson's uh, research team at University of Toronto that explicitly links um, the wider awareness, visual awareness that comes with positive emotions to the ability to link, make um, conceptual links between unusual words. So it's one of the first studies that links perceptual broadening with conceptual language, linguistic broadening, so that when we see more, our vocabulary um, becomes more richly interconnected. And so we can, when you, when you have a broader uh, appreciation of the world around you, you can make disparate links better. And that makes us more uh, creative. There's also good evidence um, from my lab and others that shows that positive emotions help people become more resilient, help people bounce back from adversity. We've um, captured that uh, in experimental studies where we look at cardiovascular recovery from stress. We've also looked at that, uh, the role of positive emotions as people deal with natural, well, not so natural uh, world traumas. We've looked at uh, the role of positive emotions as people coped with uh, the aftermath of September 11th in the United States. Uh, and we find that positive emotions are a very vital ingredient that helps people uh, keep depression at bay and show some um, unexpected post-crisis growth. We also have experiments that show that if you induce positive emotions, that wider awareness, Kids perform better at end-of-year tests, you know, on, on, or on SATs, um, on, you know, college entrance exams, that uh, people are better able to access what they've learned previously. So, you know, instead of spending the last moments before an exam cramming down facts, further facts into our brains, we should be taking a moment to just think of the last most delightful, you know, laugh you shared with a friend that's the kind of thing that's going to help you do better on an exam. There's also uh, a work outside of um, academic performance um, looking at managerial performance and how managers uh, are successful in leading teams and that is improved uh, when, when managers are experiencing positive emotions. So there's again a wide range of repercussions that come from this having a broader awareness uh, the very important early study um, by Alice Eisen, who is a, a pioneer researcher in this area, uh, she used that simple bag of candy intervention with physicians who were asked to solve a complex uh, internal medicine case. And she found that the physicians who got the bag of candy before the case to solve actually made better decisions as judged by a panel of physicians compared to those who got the bag of candy later. Um, 
they were more likely to jump to conclusions and, and, and stop thinking about, they'd go with the most obvious symptom and, and kind of jump to a foregone conclusion about the case. So again, this uh, speaks volumes about how we should approach our next doctor's visit. So instead of just bringing our list of complaints, we should also maybe bring that little cellophane wrapped up bag of candy with us or some, um, some similar treat. <laughs> um, there's uh, some very important work done by one of my former um, doctoral students for his dissertation. And he's found that, uh, this is Kareem Johnson, he found that uh, when people are induced to experience a positive emotion in a laboratory setting, again, just by seeing a short film clip, people are more likely to look past things that divide them from other people, like racial and cultural boundaries, and are more likely to recognize somebody of a, of a different race, um, recognize who they are as an individual. Whereas most often, uh, when people are feeling neutral or, oh, sorry, neutral or negative emotions, um, uh, people are not so good at recognizing individuals across racial lines. Uh, a bigot might call that as a phrase in the United States, oh, they all look the same to me. You know, all the people who aren't like me look the same. Okay. And that holds when people are experiencing neutral and negative states. When people are experiencing a positive state, a mild state of amusement from watching a comedy, they're actually better at recognizing individuals across racial lines. Not just a little better, the own race bias effect is eliminated altogether. People are just as good at recognizing individuals across racial lines as they are at recognizing people of their same race. Okay, it's a temporary effect. It's, a, it's an effect that holds when people are experiencing positive emotions, but extraordinarily uh, uh, powerful in its implications. Um, that we can't build relationships with people across racial lines if you can't recognize who the individual is. So this is the beginning uh, uh, precondition for being able to, to build effective multicultural teams. There's also good experimental work to suggest that when people are experiencing positive emotions, they expand their circle of trust. Okay, they are more likely to be trusting of acquaintances. Okay, and, and you, you, as you can imagine, this is not always a good thing. I and mean, this is probably what advertisers try to use positive emotions in their appeals is because they want you to trust them. Um, but uh, in, in daily interactions with uh, colleagues and um, potential uh, business collaborators, this greater trust can be very, very important. Uh, there's been some really nice, elegant um, work coming out of business schools looking at the effects of emotions on negotiations. And this team has found that um, uh, when people come to the bargaining table with uh, a respect for positive emotions, both they present positive emotions and they think they're led to believe that positive emotions are important for nego negotiations compared to people who are led to believe that being stern and negative is good for negotiations. Or another group that's led to believe that being very poker-faced and not showing your emotions is the best way to approach negotiations. Those who approach negotiations with positive emotions strike more win-win solutions with their negotiating partner. Okay, So again, um, that's one way to... Uh, catalog them as better able to negotiate, not in an exploitive way, but in a way that allows each person to leave feeling like they got what they wanted. And I want to emphasize here that this is not simply the same old story that we've long heard about how positive emotions affect our thinking. It's not simply the case that we're looking through rose-colored glasses. Okay, that, that is true that people Experiencing a positive emotion, see more positive things in their environment. That is true, but it's not the whole story here. Likewise, it's not just the glass is half full instead of half empty. Those are true, but in addition, there's a perhaps more important cognitive effect of positive emotions is that they allow us to see the big picture. They expand our awareness and allow us to see the whole. 
to see the whole system in its, in its uh, working. And that's the kind of thinking that we're going to need to solve these big world-class problems, global warming, uh, obesity, and uh, getting aid to um, people who need it in other parts of the world. So we need to be able to see and think at a big picture level, at a systemic level, to be able to solve uh, those large problems. Now, the other core fact about positive emotions that I want to share uh, with you today is that positive emotions transform us for the better. They literally get under our skin and change who we are. Um, you know, while you're sitting here this afternoon, um, uh, parts of you are changing. New cells are being born within you, um, and other cells are, are decaying. Um, the, there's some scientists who make this suggestion that um, we, across all of our different body systems, from our taste buds to our bones, but we replace about 1% of our cells each day. So that would be, if you take that metric um, further, that would be another 1% tomorrow, another 1% the next day, amounting to 30% new cells by next month, and by next season, 100% new cells. Now, that's not literally true for your bones. Your bones take longer to turn over than your taste buds, but on average, that's... Um, uh, the, I, one of the things I find really striking is that three months is also about the time that people who study habit formation say it takes to learn a new habit or to make a lifestyle change. So it's possible that uh, we can't teach an old cell new tricks. We can only teach a new cell new tricks. Um, so it's, it's possible that, that you know, every season we renew ourselves and we can, when we want to make a big change in our lives, it can take about a season for that change to hold. And uh, given that that's the case, what I'm arguing is that if we increase our daily diets of positive emotions, just like we're told to increase our daily diets of fruits and vegetables, that those positive emotions, like fruits and vegetables, nourish us and give us what we need. Give us the nourishment we need to change and grow and become the best versions of ourselves. Uh, and I, um, in doing uh, more research on this part of um, this aspect of positive emotions, the long-term aspects, what happens when we increase our daily diets of positive emotions, I've come to realize that we can change our trait levels of positive emotions but doing so is very much like making any other lifestyle change. The, the um, best research on this suggests that it takes as much effort, intention, and impulse control as does lowering your cholesterol or losing weight. That changing your trait, characterological levels of positive emotions is not something that you just do on a whim and decide, okay, I'm now I'm gonna be more cheery. You know, it's something that takes um, continual reinforcement. And I liken it to uh, moving a river, okay? It's, it's more possible than moving a mountain, but it's not something that you do on a whim or without continual reinforcement and, and, and shoring up the, the shores. Um, and in my research lab's uh, journey to finding a way to do this, to help people make a lifestyle change that would increase their positive emotions, we turned to studying meditation. Um, and in particular, an ancient form of meditation that is called loving kindness meditation. And I chose that because it expressly helps people learn to self-generate positive emotions more readily and more frequently. Okay. And it starts by having people in, um, really call to mind the, the, the physical feelings that they have in um, uh, thinking about somebody they already care for greatly. You know, somebody who they already feel warm and tender feelings for. Maybe a child, could be a pet, uh, usually a loved one. And to practice uh, cultivating that feeling in their heart 
and sort of slowly letting that feeling become detached from that particular individual, but to, to maintain holding on to that feeling and then to gradually extend that feeling to people who you might not already feel that way towards, to people you might feel neutral about. You know, what, it, what does it take to experiment feeling warm and caring about people who you might otherwise feel rather neutral about? And then eventually um, to uh, radiate that uh, kind of friendly feeling, as it's described sometimes, a warm and tender feeling of care and concern to all beings on Earth. Okay, so this isn't necessarily an easy practice for people to learn. It's not magic. It's not like you say a few phrases and then you're automatically sunny. It's, it's, people experience difficulties and barriers, um, but over the course of, of six weeks or so, uh, some people really get very skilled at generating these kind of open heart, genuine feelings of, of love and concern for others. And what we find is that, um, on average, if we randomly assign people to either learn this meditation technique or not, uh, when we've tracked their emotions on a daily basis, we find that those in the meditation group do increase their positive emotions subtly. Okay, it's not a, it's not a really big change, um, and that's, uh, I think, to be respected and, and, and uh, uh, recognized here, that people aren't turning themselves into completely new people. They're just a little bit warmer, a little bit, um, a little bit more caring uh, compared to people who don't learn the meditation techniques. So positivity, uh, people's trait, positive emotions can increase. And doing so has an important effect on changing who people are. Uh, positive emotions build people's resources, and I just want to describe a few of those resources here. It can build cognitive resources, like the ability to be mindful of the current circumstances. People's trait levels of mindfulness increased to the extent that they showed that increase in positive emotions. People also report that their relationships with others are more uh, warm and positive. Um, as a result of having that increase in daily positive emotions. People also report greater resilience, a greater ability to um, uh, adapt to their changing current circumstances. And uh, we also find that people report fewer aches, pains, headaches, stomach aches, um, after, to the extent that they've shown that increase in positive emotions. So, People can increase their daily diets of positive emotions, and doing so transforms people for the better. So like uh, that butterfly emerging from the cocoon, positive emotions nourish uh, the potential in us to become better versions of ourselves. And I think this is not just something that shows up in our outward appearance. It's something that's also happening deep at the cellular level or at this, I like this image of the synapse, of the, uh, the action going on between the synapse, um, that positive emotions are, are changing us both in our outward abilities and skills, uh, in our intelligence navigating through the world, but also deeply in a cellular level. There's new research that has been done to show that negative emotions affect our health by changing gene transcription in our immune, in our in inflammation and immune related genes. Okay, and I've got some um, studies proposed that allow us to see whether positive emotions are altering our immune system at a cellular level by changing our gene transcription. So when I come back in uh, five or ten years, maybe I'll be able to tell you about that work, but I'm, I'm confident that we're going to be able to find the biological pathways through which our positive emotions this season affect our immune system next season. Because we already have really good circumstantial evidence that links positive emotions to health, to le being less likely to get the common cold and so on. And we just need to find the exact uh, pathway. Um, another thing, another resource that uh, positive emotions uh, effect is what's called uh, vagal tone. Um, and 
the vagus nerve is uh, a part of the parasympathetic nervous system, and one of the things that it does is it connects our brain to our hearts. Um, and this is actually some research that I had the tremendous honor to be able to present to His Holiness the Dalai Lama last month um, because it shows how this particular ancient meditation technique alters aspects of the physical body that have long been thought to be just stable personality, genetically determined um, systems. So this vagal tone in particular, the, the vagus nerve, one of the things it does is it slows our naturally high heart rates. Okay? Um, mammals have very high heart rates. Um, they tend to, be, to run really high, and the parasympathetic nervous system is the calming branch of our nervous system. And the vagus nerve in particular slows the heart rate, but it does so only when it's useful to slow it down. So the way it's measured, the way vagal tone is measured, is by looking at variability in heart rate. When does heart rate slow down? When does it pick up? And the, the particular pattern that vagal tone um, uh, represents is that when you're breathing in, it's actually helpful to have a very fast heart rate because you want to oxygenate as much blood as possible. When you're breathing out, it does, it's not helpful to have a fast heart rate. So that's when your, your vagal, the vagus nerve can slow down your heart. So vagal tone is measured as the degree to which your heart rate speeds up when you breathe in and slows down when you breathe out. It's that breathing related um, heart rate variability. And what we find is that, um, oh just one second, um, and I just want to point out the different things that vagal tone has been linked to. In terms of physical health, it's linked to better, high vagal tone is linked to better glucose regulation, um, lower levels of diabetes. It's related to um, better cardiovascular health, less likelihood of, of um, cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's, it's related to um, uh, lower levels of certain cancers. So it's, it's been a very important cardiovascular measure as an index of overall health. It's also connected to some very important measures of psychological health that people with high vagal tone have been shown to be better, at, better able to regulate their attention, better able to regulate their thoughts, better able to regulate their behavior. Okay, so it's, it's, having high vagal tone is considered to be a key resource that helps people be resilient and adaptable to changing circumstances. And again, I want to underscore that vagal tone has been viewed as a genetic trait or as a very stable trait. People either, you know, after childhood, they have a level of vagal tone that stays fairly consistent. But what we found in our most recent study of using this loving kindness meditation is that people who increase their daily diet of positive emotions by learning this particular uh, meditation technique, um, those people increased their resting levels of vagal tone. This is not their heart activity while they're meditating. This is just, you know, in, in a resting laboratory visit, visit some months later. They had um, higher levels of uh, vagal tone compared to our randomly assigned control group. So again, this was uh, big news to be able to show that, we're, that this practice of self-generating positive emotions fundamentally changes the way our hearts work in a healthy way. And uh, related to this, one of my uh, current students, Bethany Cook, has um, found a very uh, important and subtle connection between vagal tone and our emotional lives, where we find that people who show high levels of this vagal tone walk around the world more experiencing more moments of love and connection with people in their daily life. More, more, uh, they feel more attuned and more connected with others. And then to the extent that they feel more attuned and connected with uh, those in their lives, their vagal tone increases. So there's a, there's a system going on here where our, our connections with others, our feeling attuned and connected with others, is affecting our vagal tone and is affected by vagal tone and they, they build on one another. There's a reciprocal uh, causality going on here in a way that creates a self-sustaining system of health 
and connection. Um, positive emotions also very much transform our relationships, and I want to describe a study here um, that uh, I've done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sarah Aljo, who is one of the leading experts on how gratitude functions in relationships. She had already found in some earlier work that gratitude in long-term relationships, expressions of gratitude, seems to be related to uh, uh, supporting the relationship, sort of acting as a booster shot in a relationship, helping people be closer over time. And while this research is um, conducted in, this, in the context of uh, marital relationships, I think it can also very much apply to parent-child relationships and, and worker uh, relationships as well. The, the way we did this study is we brought romantic couples who had been living together, either married or not, in, into our laboratory. They'd been together for a number of years. And we gave each person in the couple an opportunity to express appreciation to their partner for anything that they had done that was kind. We were just in the, uh, our goal in this study was to discover how it is that people express appreciation so that we could see how gratitude is working. Okay, so each person in the couple was in this role of the thanker where they were identifying a benefit provided by the other person, a kindness that was done. And then, each, and then um, the other per partner, and while they were being thanked, um, first just listened and added whatever they might naturally say in response to somebody thanking them. And then after uh, the expression of appreciation, they filled out a short questionnaire that measured perceived partner responsiveness. And this is a really important concept in uh, relationship literature. It suggests that it's a way, a, a kind of intimacy. I think it's best re-described as a measure of, does my partner really get me? Do they really understand what, I, what really I'm like? Why, why I do the things I do? Okay, so partner, people who score high on this would feel like um, when their partner thanked them, ah, they really understand what makes me tick. Okay, other people who scored low on it might be thinking, oh, you know, my partner thanked me for this, but they don't really get me. They don't really understand me. Okay, so feeling understood and appreciated and cared for is what this uh, measure captures. And we were interested in how uh, this perceived responsiveness might lead people to have particular feelings about themselves and about the relationship, and then six months later, whether, whether it had any relational benefits. And what we discovered in this study, um, by asking so many different couples to express appreciation, was that there were high and low quality ways of expressing appreciation that were rather non-intuitive. Okay, But I want to um, describe to you uh, an example of each one so that you can see the difference here. Uh, this is a couple who came into our laboratory um, and they gave us an example of a high quality expression of appreciation where uh, I'll call them Harry and Sally just for shorthand. Harry ha was in the job of thanking Sally for something and what he decided to thank her for was that, um, you know, he said, uh, the other day you brought me uh, a brownie or a cookie from the, from the last talk that you went to and there was a reception afterwards and you tucked a cookie aside and you brought it to me at my, at my work. And you know, that, um, that just um, makes me so happy that you think of me during the day and you think of me enough to pick up a cookie that I would like and bring it to me. And, and then she says for a moment, she said, oh, I should make cookies more often. And he's like, no, no, it's not about it's not a cookie. It's that you think of me in the day, and you think of a way to, to brighten my day by bringing me a small gift. And you don't just do this for me. You do this for everybody. You do, I see you do this for your other friends. And you just have a way of being kind to people in small ways all throughout the day. And I just love that about you. And so his high-quality way of expressing appreciation had this very important ingredient of it was very focused on who she was, who she was as a person. It wasn't focused on the benefit or the cookie. I'm going to contrast this to a low-quality expression of appreciation by another couple 
I'm not going to show you their picture for their own uh, privacy. But um, the gentleman in this couple said, oh, you know, I want to thank you for that guitar you got me for my birthday. I've been having so much fun with that guitar. I've been jamming with my friends. I've been writing new songs. I've been blah, 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 blah. So you get the point that he, he, in the word thank you, he very quickly touched on the you, and then it was all back to himself. It was himself and the guitar. Okay, so in the, in the triad between other person's self and the benefit, a low quality expression of appreciation focuses on self and the benefit. And a high quality expression of appreciation focuses on the other person. Okay, so there's a degree of other focus that marked the difference here. And the way we know they were high versus low quality is when people heard expressions of appreciation that had a lot of this other focus, that's when they told us on this questionnaire, ah, oh, my partner really understands me. They really get me. And that's what we used as a metric of high quality, is that the partner felt understood, validated, and cared for. Um, now, what we learned was that when people gave these high, when they thanked in a way that focused on the other person, the other person says, ah, they, get re they really get me. That person would walk around the world for the next two weeks feeling pretty good about themselves and pretty good about the relationship. And six months later, they were more satisfied with the relationship. Now, those low quality ways of expressing appreciation, we didn't discover that they caused any direct harm that they didn't do any of this good. There was no cascade forward into daily life or six months later into the quality of the relationship. It's like those ways of expressing appreciation were just simply inert. They had no effect. They didn't build and transform the relationship. But a high quality expression of appreciation that was very other focused literally elevated the relationship and elevated people's experience of, of their daily life. Uh, I want to point out here that uh, just like any living thing, any plant, um, we can all either languish in life, barely holding on to life, technically alive but not really quite thriving, or flourish, becoming uh, ripe with possibility, very remarkably resilient to hard times, and um, and very generative. And what I want to point out is that positivity, our experiences of positive emotions, lights our path towards flourishing. And here's a quote from 20th century theologian Thomas Merton that I think captures this effect very well, that he wrote that things that are good are good. And if one is responding to that goodness, one is in contact with a truth from which one is getting something. Now, at one level, uh, especially if, uh, a very rational scientist would say, this is just simply circular. Things that are good are good. But if we decompose goodness into all of its different facets, uh, we can see something, uh, a larger system hidden in here. And I want to just return briefly to that um, water lily analogy that I raised earlier, that um, we know that sunlight is critical to the growth of all plants. And at some level, plants know this, and they turn towards the light and stretch themselves open to take in as much of that nourishment as they can. Scientists call us the heliotropic effect. Uh, there's a similar heliotropic effect in humans in that positive emotions and positivity is critical to the growth of all humans. And that at some level, some unconscious level, we know that and turn towards the light, broadening our awareness as much as we can to take in that nourishment so that we can grow. And that's, I call this the broaden and build effect. The broaden and build theory of positive emotions is the anchoring theory that my students and collaborators and I have been working on the last dozen or more years um, that describes the why of positive emotions. Why do we have positive emotions? Why are positive emotions necessary um, in our daily experience? It's because they nourish growth and transformation. They help us become the best versions of ourselves 
at an automatic, non-conscious way. So we don't have to be thinking, I want to be a better person. If we experience a lot of positive emotions, we will become a better person um, just as the, uh, like an uh, acorn grows into an oak tree. And I want to turn now, just in the uh, last portion of my talk, from description of what positive emotions do to a prescription. Um, and to get at this question, if we know positive emotions are good for us, how much is enough? How much positive emotion should we be striving for in order to go... over the, ra the tipping point ratio, whereas everybody else had ratios. A more typical ratio is about two to one, okay? And people who are depressed tend to have ratios under one to one, okay? Um, so one of the things I really appreciate about this idea of a three to one ratio of, of positive to negative emotions is that it underscores that negative emotions are also valuable for flourishing. And here, I think a sailboat metaphor is uh, very useful. Um, 
rising from the sailboat is an enormous mast that allows the sail to catch the wind and that actually powers the boat. But underneath the water line is the keel, which can weigh tons. You could take the mast going up as positivity, the keel down below as negativity, and if you sail, you know that even though it's the mast holding the sail that literally fuels the boat, you can't sail without the keel. You just slide around the water aimlessly or worse yet, you know, turtle the boat. Okay, it's the, the keel that especially matters when you're trying to sail upwind or in difficult circumstances. Having honest, genuine expressions of negative emotions are also extraordinarily vital for flourishing. So this is not a version of, of of uh, promote the positive that endorses um, masking all negative emotions. That's not healthy. Um, I just want to quickly touch on, okay, now I've given you some basics about positive emotions. How is it that we can, aside from learning this meditation technique that I've mentioned, what are other ways to increase positive emotions in daily life? Oh, so here's my advice. Actually, uh, it's don't make your motto be positive. If that's your motto, it can produce toxic insincerity that has actually been found to be physically corrosive to the heart. This is the big danger of learning the value of positive emotions is that some people will take it on in the most superficial of ways that actually um, dramatically backfires. So it's um, uh, very uh, important not to just fake positive emotions. Fake positive emotions do as much damage as uh, inappropriate negative emotions do. But that said, here's a quote that I really appreciate, a Sufi proverb. There wouldn't be such a thing as counterfeit gold if there were no real gold somewhere. So we can take the idea that there are all these yellow smiley faces, the counterfeit gold, as an indication that there really is something valuable in connecting with people in a positive and sincere way. So what I think is better than making your motto be positive is to lightly create the mindset of positivity. And here are some different ways to do that. There are different mottos that you could have to be open, be appreciative, be curious, be kind, and above all, be real. Don't deny negative emotions when they are uh, fully appropriate to the situation. Now, a lot of these are really um, straightforward. I want to just take a second to focus on why be open would uh, unlock more positive emotions in our lives. Um, so often we can be uh, involved in mental time travel, um, worrying about the future, obsessing about the past, that we miss the very subtle sources of positive emotions that are right here, right now, right in the current circumstance. Okay, so when we are involved in mental time travel, we blind ourselves to the sources of goodness in the current moment. And studies have shown that when people can be more mindfully aware of the current moment, they are better able at learning the positive contingencies within those situations. They're better able to pick up the cues of uh, of uh, sources of goodness, um, the, the kindness of others uh, in this auditorium, uh, the natural beauty of the gorgeous day we had yesterday, um, and uh, different things like that are, are more at our fingertips when we're able to be open to the present moment. Uh, I also have uh, developed a very quick way for people to kind of step on the scale and measure their positivity ratio. Um, I have a website called positivityratio.com. We find that 80% of Americans, I don't know about Finns, um, score below the ideal 3 to 1 ratio. So it's actually relatively rare for people to be flourishing. Um, and you can uh, take the scale and figure out wh where you stand for the last 24 hours. So while I, th while I think it's interesting to find out what your positivity ratio is for the last 24 hours, if you really want to find out what your life is like, you need to take it every night for two weeks or so and see what's typical, because any one day could be atypical. Um, 
And what I, what I want to point out just real briefly is when people take a measure like that, in our studies, uh, I showed you a version of this slide earlier where I showed uh, that it was what I, what I like to refer to sometimes as the move the river slide, that positivity can increase. When we went back to that sample of people who we taught meditation to more than a year later, and we asked them one, one question, well, we asked them a number of things, but we asked them, are you still meditating? One third of them said that they had sustained their med meditation practice um, more than a year later. And when we went back and looked at their, their profile of positive emotions, uh, we found that the people who continued meditating looked totally different from the people who eventually quit. Uh, they had a, a very fast, early positive emotional response to learning meditation. And what we can say statistically is that if you had this early positive response to the meditation, you were four to five times more likely to be continuing to meditate 15 months later um, compared to people who didn't have that early response. So as you try new things, as you dabble in, and discover, oh, I want to try a, keeping a gratitude journal. I want to try these other positive psychology exercises. I think paying close attention to how those things make you feel today can help you figure out whether it's going to be a lasting lifestyle change for you. You don't have to wait a year. You can actually cycle through some choices really early on, find ones that really fit for you, and they uh, make a difference. Um, just in closing, I, wanna, I want to um, share a, a favorite quote of mine, a favorite little story. It's a Native American story. Uh, that, uh, one evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is negativity. It is anger, sadness, stress, contempt, disgust, fear, embarrassment, guilt, shame, and hate. The other is positivity. It is joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and above all, love. And the grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. So with that, I just would uh, be happy to take it on to discussion. So. Thank you very much, Barbara. That was wonderful and, and, and so, so inspiring. Also, uh, also in many ways, uh, quite uh, informing regarding some of those things that perhaps one doesn't uh, automatically think. In fact, one way to interpret what you just said and perhaps more generally your work would be to say that uh, positive emotions have uh, you could say immediate benefits. For instance, the fact that it's, it's good to feel joyful, let's say. Feels good. Right. But in fact, what you are saying is that uh, it's the long-term benefits, right. which uh, de facto are even more important. Right. OK. So, so uh, and in fact, you, you, uh, you, you pointed that out perhaps most explicitly when you referred to uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. as one of the things that your um, research team has, uh, mm -hmm. has measured. Can you tell a bit more about, yeah, about yeah. that? We have, um, spent, we have a, a whole research program that looks at the differences between people who score high on a very simple survey measure of uh, trait resilience. It predicts what, what, how people will fare in adversity. And the, the, Across a number of studies, the, the most central difference between people who are resilient and those who aren't is that when they face hard times, they don't exclusively feel negative emotions. Low resilient people, when they face hard times, tend not to experience any positive emotions. High resilient people, when they face hard times, feel all the negative emotions that the low resilient people do and Side by side with those negative emotions, they also feel 
love and gratitude and interest and awe and, and a spectrum of positive emotions. So it's that ability to hold very different uh, emotional states in, in our experience and have that complex reaction that, 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 that uh, positive emotions, having positive emotions in the mix seems to be what allows people to bounce back from adversity. We've seen that in terms of their cardiovascular recovery from stress. We've seen that in terms of people's ability to, to ward off depression after 9-11. Uh, we've seen that in people's abilities to um, uh, not get too worked up about a possible threat when, we're, when we put them through a, a brain imaging procedure. Um, they're, they're able to just sort of sit quietly and take each moment as it comes instead of bracing themselves for a possible negative thing. So. Okay, so that, that basically means, for instance, that if there's a tragedy uh, that obviously generates uh, negative emotions in the person who undergoes the tragedy, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there, there are, in the midst of those negative emotions, there are also some positive emotions. For instance, the realization of how much I love, let's say, my child. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, or, or uh, appreciation of those moments you shared with the person, if, right. if it's somebody who died, for instance. Right. right. Yeah. I think when I when I uh, present our research on um, Americans' responses to 9/11, I sh I you know will show the towers um, crumbling, but in the next slide we'll show a candlelight vigil where there's a, a woman leaning on her husband, and they're really um, they're expressing compassion for others in the, in the country who are suffering and they're leaning in on each other, feeling their support of one another. So it is a really dire situation, but there is real tenderness and compassion right, right in the mix. And that's really what uh, helps us to be our best. Yeah, uh, just as kind of a little uh, side comment. When you were talking about uh, uh, the, the, the ratio and, and uh, of course in a sense that highlights the fact that it's, it's not only um, being positive that is the point, right. but uh, so somehow balance, it's a balancing act right. rather than just the smiling all the time act. And of course at the end you quite concretely and I would say in a way that uh, speaks to us Finns very strongly, <laughs> you know, uh, don't be positive. <laughs> uh, uh, because, I, I mean, we, we appreciate uh, authenticity and, and, and honesty. Yes. But one thing that I think we Finns do have as a strength is a uh, uh, kind of uh, inbuilt pragmatism. Uh -huh. So if, if something makes sense, I think we can, uh, we can reach out to that. Mm -hmm. so, so basically what you are saying is that uh, being uh, in positive emotional states makes sense, makes sense because in the longer run it builds, for instance, your resilience. Right. And of course, resilience is sort of a, a um, concept that rings a little bit like Sisu. So, so, so uh, maybe this is the sort of the, the new century Finnish that, that now, you know, through her, his uh, great-grandfather, father's, how do you pronounce it and put it, uh, the daughter is here. Uh -huh. So, you know, the, so, so you present the so vision for Finns. <laughs> and, 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 and I noticed that it's, um, you could say, uh, Quite a strong position, really, uh, when you think about, uh, because obviously we do have an influence in some sense in the long run mm -hmm. uh, on what kind of emotional states we are in. I right. mean, obviously, you can't always control it, but to some extent, you, right. you, you do have an influence. Right. Right. So, so basically, what you are saying is, uh, let's try to steer ourselves, let's try to lead ourselves right. to, move, to be more in positive emotional states right. so as to push the ratio up. Right. And I think that it's very common for people to think that emotions are just like the weather. We don't control it. It's either raining one day or beautiful. 
and that we, uh, it's really outside of our control. But um, uh, it, the science of emotion points out how there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between circumstances and our emotions. What sits in between is how we interpret our circumstances. And there's a wide range of latitude in how we can interpret every circumstance. There's no circumstance, I would argue, that is 100% negative, at least while we're still breathing. Okay? If you can at least breathe, you have something to appreciate, however small it is compared to the, to the rest. And so if we can attune ourselves to, to looking at the, all the shades of gray and finding the light in those shades of gray, then we can seed more positive emotions. And, and we do have, we can take the reins of our emotional lives more than we think, more than we give ourselves credit for. Okay, but that also means that there is a possibility for the intellect to step in. Because uh, obviously when you face, uh, let's say, gray, uh, but keeping in mind what Barbara just said, which is basically that there's, there's always a possibility for a new type of interpretation in any, any given situation, but that's partly a cognitive, intellectual type of challenge. So, uh, right. so, so uh, which I think is an important point to remember because very often in this kind of context when one is talking about emotions, right. it's easy to sort of push aside uh, the, the, the force of uh, the intellect. Right. Well, I think there's ways to um, use emotions intelligently in ways that respect how emotions uh, have evolved to govern our growth over time. So if, the more we learn about how positive emotions are just this automatic birthright that we have that helps us find ways to grow and become better versions of ourselves, then um, uh, I think that knowledge about the science of positive emotions can embolden us to say, oh, well, it's then if I go to this uh, grand party or if I uh, follow my interests in my work, that that's not trivial, that's not uh, just a luxury, that that is nourishment. It might help us steer our days differently. And one of my current doctoral students, Lana Catalino, is, is, is developing this concept um, with me called positive valuation. It's people's attitudes towards positive experience. And we think that if people learn to value at an intellectual level that there's some good in positive emotions, then in any given circumstance they will orient themselves more and take in more of those uh, good aspects that will generate positive emotions and, and, and broaden and build more and be on bigger and faster upward spirals. That starting with that attitude towards positive emotional experience can determine the degree to which we have just a little upward spiral or a larger upward spiral, you know, and, 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 and a little bit of transformation or a larger piece of transformation. Okay, so, so one conclusion there would be, uh, and basically this is something that we've been discussing in this auditorium before in the context of my, my lectures, I would say, which is this, this theme of uh, how to value one's experience more in general. Yes. Yes. And, and it's, it's, uh, would you like to comment that's this theme of valuing one's experience right. in this context? Right. I think that um, the, the degree to which we value experience is very much a cultural product that we, um, uh, children and babies value their experience. It's about what they have the most of, you know. And then we slowly learn that, oh, we should be valuing outcomes and products and material goods and paychecks and <laughs> not experience so much. So all these other things kind of crowd out experience as things that we value. And, and I think that there's a, a, a really important wisdom in turning back to valuing how something makes us feel because there's an ancient wisdom in those feelings that directs us towards things that are healthy for us. Of course, um, there's certainly uh, things that feel good that are not healthy for us, and those are 
ways that our culture has kind of exploited the positive emotion system by creating synthetic drugs that give us highs that don't necessarily lead us any good place. So it, there's, it's important to be wise in our pursuit of positive emotions and not, uh, not pick the ones that really we know are really dead ends, but um, to choose ones that are bringing us to a greater sense of integration and wholeness. You, you know, uh, what you just now say uh, reminds me of the following point, and, and let, let me say it uh, a little bit sort of roughly perhaps. Uh, uh, for centuries, uh, it has been thought that uh, sexuality is sort of suspect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so now you could say in retrospect that isn't this a little bit sort of perverse position? I mean, mm -hmm. because... Uh, on the face of it, you know, sexuality is pretty good. And, and uh, in fact, you say even more that, you know, this is the only way through which uh, the humankind can uh, reach to the future right. through generations. Okay, right. but still de facto, uh, in the course of human history, uh, it has been thought most of the time that, in fact, sexuality is suspect. Right. Now, using the similar logic, one could say, uh, well, these positive emotions are good, but you know, there's something suspect about them. Right. So, so, so although they, they feel good, although as uh, Professor Fredrickson and, and her research team and, and some other researchers have beyond any doubt demonstrated it, it generates uh, long-term benefits, mm -hmm. it's still suspect. Yes. Okay. So, 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 so can't can you sort of can you comment on this? Why are positive emotions suspect? Yes. Well, I think there's, it's, it's a great description of what a scientist of emotions is up against when they try to suggest that culturally we have a problem with positive emotions. I mean, I started this work completely because I was intellectually curious about a kind of emotion that nobody was studying. And then when you try to take it to, well, here's actually a prescription for life and how to live it, then the, then the sort of onslaught of sort of Puritan claims or, or that the, they are suspect um, come at us. And I think there's a couple of reasons why they're suspect. One is that um, positive emotions and, and, and um, unchecked hedonism is uh, a source of some people's demise, you know, uh, people who have drug addictions or gambling addictions or things like that. That is, um, those are in a way hijacking the normal, healthy, positive emotion system and um, uh, leading to bad outcomes. Um, and literally, uh, we know now that addictions um, uh, fundamentally and, and perhaps permanently change the way dopamine is released in the brain and make it very difficult to just walk away from a former addiction. But um, another reason that they're suspect, I think, and this is definitely true um, in the U.S., is that positive emotions are used to exploit us as consumers all the time. You know, like you think of, um, and as employees, I'm thinking of flight attendants who are paid to be cheerful um, and, and um, greet everybody with a cheerful smile. And we know, well, they don't really care about me, or at least in the Ex US. Except the queen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's some others. Yeah, but no, actually, what I, what I noticed is when I've traveled to other countries, I've realized this is generally true of America, that there's a lot of, like, um, Good day, good day. You know, there's a lot of greeting that was not very heartfelt. Um, and so we're suspicious of people who greet us at a store and try to make us cheerful because we think they just want us to buy their product. Um, and so I think like there's, there's initiatives um, in the U.S. that are called Take Back the Night, Make the Night a Safe Time to Be Outside, especially for women, because there's a lot of uh, unsafe areas at night. There are marches called Take Back the Night. I think we need to have Take Back the Smile. You know, make the smile be a form of genuine human connection instead of something that is used to sell a car or sell uh, any number of products. So I think we're suspicious of positive emotions for when they've been misused as a way to get us to open our wallet or 
or, or, or be more trusting when, when maybe we shouldn't. So. Very good. Uh, let, let me open the floor for questions uh, over there. Can, can, can you uh, – uh, let's see how to get the, the... – Tuossa on Jaakko antamaan. Pana tämä mikki kiertämään, mä tuossa toisen. Uh, I recognize that you talked much about positive emotions. You didn't talk about positive thinking or positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm not psychologist, but I understand that there are cognitive psychologists and there are psychologists like Leslie Greenberg who talk about emotions. Right. So, please explain more what is the cause and effect in your thinking? Is it, where, where does the, you, you already said that meditation creates positive thoughts, uh, positive emotions. Right. But what about thoughts? Right. Well, their um, psychology used to think that emotions and thoughts were two separate things. And now we understand that there's no separating thoughts from emotion. That thinking is emotional and emotions are sparked by thinking. That they're, they're just so completely interwoven. And um, my work is, is consistent and builds from uh, what are called appraisal theories of emotion that really uh, elevate our interpretations of the situation as the um, things that trigger an emotion. Benign interpretations um, uh, trigger positive emotions and interpretations of threat uh, and harm uh, trigger negative emotions. S but that appraisal tendency is considered part and parcel of the emotion. Uh, the reason I think positive emotions are, are more deserving of our focus than positive thinking is, is that positive, uh, one, one reason is that emotions are simultaneously a mind and body event. They affect our brains, they affect our physiology and our heart functioning and the biochemical cascade that's running through our bodies. So emotions uh, are holistic and um, influence our entire being. Um, thoughts do to a much subtler degree. And positive thinking, I think, only is consequential for our future health to the extent that it elicits positive emotions. And the uh, appraisals don't always, positive thinking doesn't always lead to positive emotions. I think of it as the difference between uh, wearing a t-shirt that's very popular in the U.S. that says, life is good. Like, the whole time you're wearing that t-shirt, are you feeling buoyant and upbeat? Or is that just a phrase that you are endorsing? Um, and you might also feel pretty crummy while you're wearing that t-shirt. Um, so that there are some times that we say to ourselves positive things and we don't really, truly believe them in a full body, emotional way. So we might say, um, everything's going to be okay, but we don't really feel that running through our whole bodies. I think there's a difference between uh, what Asa and I have been talking about is sort of what I call eyes closed positivity and eyes open positivity. And there's that, there's sort of a way in which uh, for people who've adopted be positive as their motto, they run positive thoughts through their mind in a way that um, they're not really sinking in and becoming what they really truly believe all the way through their body. So they're thinking, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, I won't, I won't bother thinking about this problem because it's going to be fine. You know, there's a lot of uh, denial going on with that. Um, and so I think that genuine heartfelt positive emotions broaden our awareness. They open our eyes further. And so we don't have the problem of what I call sort of the rigid eyes closed positivity, which is more about self-talk than about really filtering down into how we really, you know, do we really feel safe? Do we really feel connected? Do we really see possibilities? 
So, so I think some forms of positive thinking um, don't go far enough to seep down and become emotions. Th 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 thank you. Uh, over there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Mr. Uh, Sinan uh, mentioned that uh, positivity is kind of suspect, but... Uh, leave it louder. Uh, all right. Um, you mentioned that positivity or the positive is suspect. Now, I would like to add that it also does not have a kind of like a scientific definition, you know. Positive is always towards a specific end. So apart from the the end slide where the Cherokee was uh, kind of like giving this description of the, the two wolves and let's say the positive was joy, this, 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 etc. and the negative was anger, stress and some other emotional states and these were kind of like sort of labeled as negative. Now I guess the negative and positive in the natural world uh, it just doesn't exist. It only makes sense towards a specific end. So something is positive if it feeds a certain end. Now, if anger and stress actually assist you in achieving a certain end, mm -hmm. then they just become positive. Now, it's still the end uh, which would, uh, would have to undergo the sort of the qualitative analysis of whether the end was positive or negative then that kind of steps into the realm of the unscientific. You become, you have to become sort of, uh, you have to acquire some sort of ideology or theology for that matter. So going to the slide uh, of the theologist uh, Merton, where the guy says the good is good and a uh, couple of more lines. And uh, I guess the last line was you get something out of it. Not the, and then there was this other slide also where you, sort of show the water lily and the positivity which one would kind of like see developing from that would be the positivity of bloom and uh, the uh, please uh, sort of uh, i mean it's getting we no, just sort of a second time. so there were like two kind of like just natural indications of what positivity may mean which is first accumulation that is you get something out of it and second the bloom so that's like the the logic of cancer, which is just expansion, and it's also the logic of capitalistic growth. So positivity only feeds a never-ending expansion per the definition of these slides. So in, uh, then it's mentioned that, wow, in the aftermath of 9-11, blah, 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 uh, we see a lot of okay, negativity. Okay, thank you very much. I just mean, you're, say, you're speaking just too, just too long now. But it, it, isn't that negativity essential? Isn't Please appreciate the moment. There are 600 people in this room. Right. So, exactly. So, that's not a very positive uh, it's, it's not. rupture of... That, that, that's right, because I want you to... So I, I want to know moment. how is this... Positive? It's the ratio. Right. Uh, how is... Fine. Okay, no, I'm not able to frame it, but how is positivity, as defined by you, different from the drive of just a cell which wants to multiply? That's it. Thank you. I think that there's uh, what I, one thing I've picked up from uh, your question is that uh, the way we define positive, it could be at a lot of different levels. I mean, at one level, I think all emotions can have good outcomes in the right circumstance. This is why I really appreciate the negativity part of the ratio. That, um, uh, but the way that I define something as a positive emotion versus a negative emotion is by its pleasant subjective feel in the moment and that people would want it to continue as opposed to, I'd like to get past this, solve this problem. So negative emotions and positive emotions are both useful in the right circumstance. Um, but uh, one, uh, one's pleasant emotions are de facto wanted. We, we want to experience them again. That's a good, you know, okay. I've used the word positive for quite some time, so I've, I, get, I get kind of stuck on it. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarinen. 
This is Mikhail. Thank you. This is a simple question. Can you flourish positivity with the blank face? Can you? Flourish positivity uh -huh. with the blank face like the Finns do. Oh, can you, can you flourish without facial expressions? Yeah. Or? Yeah, I think so. I think there are plenty of positive emotions that you could be feeling that other people wouldn't recognize that you're feeling. Like feeling um, awe or interest could be what you're, that could, just like if you really like broccoli and you have that as your vegetable all the time, you might be a particular expert with certain positive emotions that are more um, quieter, less beaming. So um, there, are, there are certainly a wide range of pleasant But stages. do you still, it, is it, is it an important aspect to also show something on your face, generally? Um, I think facial expressions are really vital for helping us coordinate with others and that um, positive emotions at their core are things that help us recognize our interconnection with others. And so facial expression is a way that at an automatic, even at a distance, somebody can say, uh, just at a non-conscious level, they can realize it's safe to approach this person. I might be able to learn something from this person or, or you know, uh, 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 gain a friend, gain a resource. So facial expressions help us navigate uh, the social world and find ways of interconnecting with people and, and to experience our sort of oneness and sameness. Okay, uh, Hanna, but, but before you speak, just one, one point. Uh, I, I, I'd like everybody to appreciate the fact that, that, that uh, that Barbara is a, is a scientist. So, so Barbara is not uh, an, an, an ideologue that, that would present a position which for some reason she would like people to adopt. Uh, but uh, many of the themes that pertain on positivity are such that it's easy to sort of assume that somebody who is speaking so much of positivity must be some kind of a positivity sort of evangelist. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, sometimes I face that same uh, situation myself. But, but there's a difference uh, in, in Barbara's favor in that respect because Barbara is basically presenting the position that says that, that positive emotions have uh, features given the way the human being is. And, and these features she starts to describe, and they pertain on, uh, the, particularly on uh, the long-term effects of positive emotions. Now, you can challenge uh, whatever scientific results she has presented or some other people have presented to that effect. But uh, that's going to be a hard job. But it's very, very important to appreciate the fact that, that uh, it's, it's not just sort of a vision that would be sort of nice that she's talking about. She's talking about uh, uh, em uh, empirically based scientific uh, uh, um, facts. So, so with that in mind, uh, Hannah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I know that there are several studies made in nutritional sciences about how certain tryptophan um, uh, uh, containing uh, or tryptophan rich foods can actually uh, increase your levels of uh, positivity. Uh, then do you know if there are, there are any, any studies made on um, the quality, for instance, of uh, managerial decisions or uh, being able to see the big picture, big picture, whether that was influenced by, by eating certain tryptophan-containing uh -huh. food or if that was just uh, um, by the fact that you were given a, a tryptophan-containing uh, bag of, of uh, um, food that you yeah. couldn't open. Yeah, it's a great question. I have started my work looking at first starting with positive emotions and then looking at their downstream effects. But uh, it's very much the case that positive emotions are part of a much larger system. And one of the things that we found is that people's levels of, say, you know, this uh, uh, vagal tone that I mentioned, people with higher le levels of vagal tone 
uh, find more opportunities to experience positive emotions in their daily life. So that's some biological uh, individual difference that sets up different propensities for positive emotions. I have not studied nutrition, so I don't, uh, I don't have an answer to your question, except to say that it is very possible that uh, the way our bodies are fueled um, and functioning in any given moment changes the likelihood that we will experience positive emotions or not. For example, when we're well rested, we experience many more positive emotions than when we're exhausted. I mean, it's, it doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. So other things that help us feel, you know, capable and effective and uh, safe and satiated, you know, nutrients could do that, could definitely uh, tip the scales a little bit more towards unleashing more positives. I don't know of the research on that just because that's not my particular area, but it's very possible. That, thanks, Hannah. Then over there. I think we have two, time for two more questions. So this is the first, and then. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks. I really appreciated your your systematic presentation of the uh, the basic uh, scientific evidence of this phenomenon. But uh, now I would like to ask about the prescription phase because uh, I'm an uh, intervention researcher myself, and. Uh, work with the real life, uh, real world implementation trials. So uh, could you say something about the um, uh, translation of this evidence into, into more real world uh, right. applications and trials? Right. Well, um, it's, uh, my home work, as you say, has been in the basic science pieces, although we've, um, my research lab has been called on to do more intervention work, and in particular, the U.S. Army is very interested in building resilience for soldiers and preventing a lot of the uh, major mental health and, and social pathologies that are come from repeat deployments. And um, in, in honor of our uh, young people that we keep putting into those terrible situations, I've um, joined on a, a group to help promote this uh, comprehensive soldier fitness, not just have a physical fitness training, but also have emotional fitness training. And um, this is posing a very um, interesting challenge to the field of science, to take what we know from uh, healthy adults who might be open and interested in learning about how positive emotions might change their lives. I mean, all of our uh, study participants in the meditation studies were volunteers who were eager to learn meditation to improve their lives. So how do we take what we learn from that sample and bring it to 18-year-old, mostly males, uninterested in emotion? <laughs> or they'll say, we're soldiers, we don't have emotions. Uh, so this is an enormous challenge that we're facing to see if, does this knowledge about how emotions relate to resilience, can we package it in a way that is um, helpful to people who don't know they need it? Um, and uh, we don't know yet. I mean, this is our big challenge. We are actually, my collaborator, um, Sarah Aljo, who's worked with me on the uh, expressed appreciation work, is currently in Hawaii training our first group of soldiers in what we're calling positivity training to see if any of it sticks, and to first assess that we're not doing any harm, and then to see if we're doing any good. So, but, but to I'm, be, to I'm, be I'm, continued. I'm a little bit disappointed that you, don't, you didn't, in your response to this question concerning the intervention, refer to Mr. Intervention himself. Which? Me. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but, but, Turn it over. <laughs> but uh, over here, the last question. Thank you. Um, this might be a bit personal, so uh, feel free not to answer in, in that case. Okay. Uh, but I'm wondering if I could ask you to, to pick up an example from your personal life where this positive emotions or your science, your training has helped you. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good question. I sometimes get asked whether I do research in this area because I'm a naturally positive person 
And uh, I should now say I'm a Finn. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, actually, I, uh, I have a friend who once teased me when I started studying emotions. She said, you study emotions because you have none. That, that, that was that sort of low-key, emotionally flat. And I feel that over the last decade, I have become a student of my work. And when, especially after Marcel Losada and I discovered the three to one ratio, is when I was a, a brand new parent, trying to juggle being a scientist, being a wife, and being a mother to two toddlers. And that, um, the ratio was a very important metric to me um, that made me, especially as my oldest son started getting into that toddler stage where you're always saying, no, don't do that, no, don't do that, get away from that electric socket. You know, I realized that I was just a, a fear uh, generator. Um, and I realized that I needed to counter that by being a joy generator too. So the, 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 the ratio was, ended up being a very important metric by which to judge what kind of emotional environment I was creating for my young children as they were, as they were growing up. Um, so that's uh, one example. I've also used um, what I know about positive emotions when I uh, was facing a situation after my babies were born of being, you know, some 30 pounds overweight because I was, you know, became very sedentary as a new mom. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to stick with anything unless I love it. So I'm not going to go to the gym and do anything that I don't love. And so I started dancing more, running in the woods, and doing all things that I love, and I'm passionate about them. Um, then I don't have to think, I should work out today. It's like, oh, when do I get to? <laughs> so I used what I knew about positive emotions and the longevity of the, of the um, changes in behavior it could cause. Um, and so I feel like I've become wiser about managing my life because of what I know from my research. So I feel very, uh, very fortunate to have stumbled upon working in this area because it's helped me become a better person, I think. Beautiful. That, that, that's where we, we have to uh, end. Uh, so Barbara, let me thank you for, for coming here to other University to, to share your uh, uh, research and, and your wisdom. and. Uh, and, and, and uh, it's great that you finally came to your country. Yes. Uh, and, uh, so and we look forward to welcoming you here yeah. again. Thank you very much. Yeah.